Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Good morning, Summit. Good morning. Um, my name is Joe. If you're visiting, Joe Fields. I'm one of the elders here, and um, Edward is out of town this Sunday. We were sitting in an elders meeting um, a couple of weeks ago, and Edward mentioned that he had never been on spring break with his children. And we were like, oh, no, that, that, guy, that can't happen. So you need to go on spring break with your children. Of course, little did I know that the, uh, because I'm one of the youngest elders there, uh, that, that the whole thing would come my direction. But I have noticed this about Edward, in case you haven't, that every time there's a controversial subject, Edward goes out of town. <laughs> and somehow I end up with it. So I don't know if Edward is all that smart or I'm just real crazy for doing this. But this morning we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit. And uh, that really creates a lot of controversy uh, sometimes with people. I kind of enjoy the subject. Um, so I got the nod uh, to do this. So this morning we're going to be talking about the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me help you run through why this particular series, I think, is like one of the most important things you can learn as a Christian. Jesus, in John chapter 16, opens up the chapter by saying, All these things I have told you because... And what catches my attention is when he said all these things, if you read the Bible like I do sometimes, you just kind of get in a hurry because you, you know you need to read three chapters, like four chapters every day. And so you kind of race through. And I hit that spot that said all these things, and I went, what all, what things? So I had to kind of go back to where it all started. And it's actually one of the longest sermons Jesus ever taught. And it starts way back in John chapter 12 when Jesus picks up the topic of his crucifixion. And he basically says, unless a kernel of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains by himself. And of course, he was talking about his death and resurrection. But also by example, he was talking about how with our Christian life, if we don't fall into the ground and die to self, our Christianity is not productive or effective. And so he begins then to uh, build on one topic after another in terms of almost like an, an order that you got to get things in if things are really going to happen for you in Christ. So he talks about death to self because if you're not going to die to yourself, you're probably not going to imitate Jesus. My uh, grandson recently, uh, he's eight years old, got this um, idea that he wanted to get saved. So he called me and said, Papa, he said, uh, uh, I'm thinking about getting saved 
And my dad said, I should talk with you too. You know, you're, we're all in this together. So he said, Papa, uh, how do I get saved? And I said, well, Jace, I said, let me ask you something. Can you tell me why you need to get saved? And he went, well, I don't know. And I said, well, tell me this. What is it about Jesus that you admire so much that you want to give him your life and you want to be like him? What, what is it about Jesus you admire? And he went, I don't know. I mean, isn't that pretty much between 8 and about 19? Pretty much the answer you get to about every question is, I don't know. And so I said, well, I'll tell you what, bud. I said, why don't you read the Gospel of John? And after you read the Gospel of John, unless you and I have a talk, and you need to be able to tell me what it is you admire about Jesus, because really becoming a Christian is not just buying a ticket to go to heaven. It's about admiring Jesus so much that you pattern your life after him. Did you know that the word Christian actually means little Jesus? In the first century, the Bible tells us, the book of Acts tells us, that the first century Christians got called Christians. That's not what they called themselves. The people in the world labeled them with what was supposed to be an insult, those little Jesus people, Christians. And the label stuck. So in reality, when we profess ourselves to be Christians, what we are saying is, I looked at the life and story of Jesus, I saw that's where my salvation was, and I bought into the idea of letting God direct my life to be more and more like Jesus every year. So that's really what we bought into. So if we're not willing to die to self, as Jesus did, then we're not likely to imitate. If we're not likely to imitate, we're not likely to serve people. And if we're not going to serve, we're probably not going to have committed love, which I like the idea of committed love because Hollywood portrays love as an emotion. And those emotions come and go. But when you have committed love, when you're on the downside of those emotions, you know, like when your wife is snoring <laughs> and you're having to make committed love about <laughs> not waking her up again, you know, and you... Promise, okay, I'm just going to go sleep in the recliner until this ends. That's committed love right there, you know. And, and the next morning, you just love up on her like nothing happened, you know. That's, that's making a decision to love. That really is mature love. Mature love is making the decision to love versus just feeling it. Now, you'll feel it too. But, you know, when you go through that spell in your marriage when enough stuff has happened that the emotional part not, isn't quite where it needs to be. Well, when you practice committed love, you find out later on it all comes back. It's really kind of cool to have gone through that dynamic in marriage. So that's what committed love is. And then last week, Edward talked about impacting faith. What is impacting faith? That's when God gets a hold of you enough and the Holy Spirit gets a hold of you enough that your life actually impacts other people. And you now become an example to others to help inspire them and help move them out of from one uh, degree of glory to another as we all approach God. So impacting faith, uh, which Edward talked about last week, has a lot to do with the work of the Holy Spirit or what we call the presence of the Holy Spirit. Now in parentheses, it says the fruit of the Spirit, and that's more the outcome. What I'm going to concentrate on today is how to know and practice the presence of the Holy Spirit. Because if you know and practice the presence of the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit comes. It's kind of like an orange tree. If you, if you plant an orange tree and you nurture it and you water it and you grow it up, one day you see the fruit of all that labor as it comes out in the oranges. So the same is true in terms of imitating Jesus. As you cultivate and as you prune in your life and as you build and nurture and grow in the presence of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, self-control, uh, those kinds of things, they come out as a fruit. It's not like you end up saying, I'm going to become a more loving person. You watch. It's going to happen. That's probably not going to happen. Okay, so, but, but, so we'll talk about the presence. Now, this morning, go to the next slide. We're, in order to practice the presence of the Holy Spirit, there's several things we've got to understand. Now, I, I know that when the minute I say the Holy Spirit, it immediately, uh, if, if you're like me, it immediately creates this uh, 
bunch of expectations about what I'm going to hear. And if you grew up hearing uh, maybe the, the concept of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and that's more what was drilled into you in church, that's kind of where your mind runs first. Or if you grew up in a church where the, the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit was, were what were emphasized to you in church, that's where your mind is right now as we talk about the Holy Spirit. Well, I'm not really going to talk much about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I believe in, in fact, one of my favorite stories in the, in the uh, Bible is the book of Acts. I've been actually to the temple grounds where the day of Pentecost happened. And it's this large open area in front of uh, Solomon's uh, portico. And there were gathered that day in the thousands. I mean, we know 3,000 people became Christians, but there were far more people than that um, that day present. And one of the things they did back in those days because they didn't have PA systems is Peter gets up to speak, but in order for the people way in the back to be able to hear, one of the 12 apostles would have been stationed within hearing distance of Peter so that he could shout out to the people that were further out. So if you've ever read the book of Acts and you've wondered why it says that the 12 were speaking in tongues, it's because they were all scattered out through the audience. And as Peter spoke, one of the apostles over here would be speaking in the Parthian language to that group of people. One of the apostles over here would be speaking to someone from Philistia. And so when you read the book of Acts, you, it lists 17 different languages that were being spoken by the apostles to that audience. And, of course, when they started, it's, I, I wish somebody would make a movie about it. Tongues of fire came down and actually sat on the heads of these 12 apostles. And what marveled the people was that they've got these unschooled, fisherman type boys up there talking in languages they had never studied. The Parthians were hearing it in their tongue and the Philistias were hearing it in their tongue and the Jews were hearing it in their tongue and people from all the regions of the world were actually hearing the gospel preached for the first time and they knew these boys had never taken a Babel class to be able to learn a new language. And they remark on that. They go, wait a minute. Uh -uh. Isn't this the, the, the 12 guys? And, and, and how is this we hear everybody talking in our language? And, of course, Peter talks about the fact that the gift of the Spirit had come on them, and they were now preaching in languages they had never studied before. I just think that's the coolest concept. that God. Can you imagine God's trying to get the gospel started in the world and he's going to use this miraculous gift so that you can go anywhere in the world at any time and speak the language without having studied it. Now, I think that'd be cool. Now, I don't have that gift. I've been all over the world. I've been, you know, Middle East hundreds of times. And, you know, one of the things, uh, even just I, I, in San Diego, one of the things I ran into were people there talk a lot of Spanish. And I tried real hard to learn how to speak Spanish. And the habla espanol just didn't come to me, man. I just, I had a hard enough time with English, you know, because I'm from Texas. We speak a whole nother language, you know, and, and I tried to get the English, uh, the Spanish thing down and I just couldn't get it. And I really wanted to because all the people in the stores would be habla in espanol and wouldn't you love it? Or, or people in a group that you were with, if they wanted to say something about you and, and, and they didn't want you to know it. They'd hobble, hobble a little bit, and, and you wouldn't have a clue what they were saying. Every once in a while, I would go, I understand more than I act like, and I didn't have a clue what they were saying. <laughs> so I don't have the gift of tongues. I don't have the gift of interpretation, but I just, I, I think uh, the gift that the Holy Spirit gives is just phenomenal. I just love some of the work uh, that the Holy Spirit does. Now, this morning, when I get into the Holy Spirit, I understand that there's a bit of mystery involved in it. And I don't know anybody that knows everything about the Holy Spirit. I don't know anybody that knows everything about God or everything even about Jesus. I think, you know, it's a little bit like an ocean. You can wait around a little bit, but you get too deep out there in theology and you just drown. And so uh, I'm not going to portray to you this morning that, I, I, you know, everything there is to know about the Holy Spirit. I'm going to talk about one thing, the, how to practice the presence of the Holy Spirit. Because this is something you can do to participate 
in the whole process of being a disciple. I like what Peter says. Peter calls it participating in the divine nature, that that can actually happen. Now, I know the Holy Spirit's kind of a mystery to some people because um, a lot of our culture was raised at a time when the Bible called the Holy Spirit the Holy Ghost. And I don't know about you, but that one to me is kind of like, ooh, ghosties, you know, hey, Casper. Uh, I, I, so it, it just kind of feels odd to me to call uh, a, a nature of the Godhead the Holy Ghost. Ghost. It's not really a good even interpretation of, of the original language. Spirit is a much closer interpretation. So I refer to uh, this part of the nature of God as the Holy Spirit because I, it doesn't creep me out as much as uh, talking about God. I don't believe in ghosties anyway. Uh, Luke 16 makes it real clear that the, there's a big chasm between the dead and the living and the dead can't come back and mess with us. And I'm really glad that's in there because just the whole concept of creepiness just isn't something I want to deal with. So it's the Holy Spirit. I know it's a mystery, but we're going to unpack one part of the nature of the Holy Spirit today and how he works with us and how we participate in that presence. So Acts 2.38 says that when we come into Christ, we get our sins forgiven and we get the gift of the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean the Holy Spirit gives us a gift. That means the Holy Spirit himself is a gift. Like when Jesus got the gifts of gold, you know, the wise men brought Jesus a gift of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. What was the gift? The gold, the frankincense, and the myrrh were the gift. Well, when the Bible talks about getting the gift of the Holy Spirit, it is not talking about a miraculous gift. It is talking about the Holy Spirit as a gift. That's validated in Acts 5, verse 32, which says that when we become followers of Jesus, he gives every believer the Spirit to dwell in us. So you have a spiritual presence in you, literally. And you'll see as we get deeper into this today, it's not something to be creeped out about. It's really something to be kind of excited about. And when you actually learn how to use it, it's a little bit like um, um, having a Mac computer. It's got all these bells and whistles on it. And I know when I first got mine, I didn't know how to use all that stuff. But as I played with it more and played with it more, I've seen more and more its potential and capability. And, and, you know, originally when I got it, I was a little bit of a Luddite. I didn't really like technology that much. But as I've played with this thing a bit, I've gotten where I really like it. It's kind of, it can do some crazy stuff on these computers. And so the Holy Spirit's kind of the same way. Once you grasp what it is you have living in you, and learn how to use it, it's really kind of a cool gift uh, to be given the Holy Spirit. The gifts of the Spirit, I believe in, uh, given by the Holy Spirit. So God gives the gift of the Holy Spirit to dwell in every disciple, but then the Holy Spirit gives gifts to believers at his own discretion. And then the presence of the Holy Spirit that we're going to talk about this morning is actually the act of being present in the heart and outward behavior of a disciple Second Peter, which we're going to end up with uh, today, calls it participating in the divine nature. And I'll just go ahead and give you the takeaway from this morning's lesson now so that you can kind of be marinating with it a little bit as we go through this. I'm hoping you leave here today very invested in participating in the presence of the Holy Spirit, that you're in tune with how to get in tune with when the Spirit is leading you and where he's leading you. Because just like with the computer, the better you get at it, the more it brings about an effectiveness in your life that really helps you grow spiritually. So let's go back. We'll start in John 14, where Jesus introduces this concept of the presence of the Holy Spirit. He's told them, I'm going to die. I'm going to die to self. You need to imitate how I've taught you and how I've lived. You need to be committed in your love towards one another. You need to learn how to have an impacting faith. And here's the key to do it. Learn how to practice the presence of the Spirit. So I'm in John 14, and I've got this thing up here. It's paper and leather, and it's called a Bible. I know that's kind of old school, but I kind of love the old school Bible, you know, because then I can see things across the page and all my notes I've written in there. I can't do that on my phone. I have to admit, though, most of the time when I come to hear preaching, I bring my phone. But when I preach, I still like picking up my Bible. There's just something about picking up my Bible. It just kind of makes me feel like I'm right all up in the middle of it. So John 14, if you have your Bible, turn to verse 15. 
Watch what it says. If you love me, do you catch yourself going, do I love Jesus? If you love me, keep my commands. I'll ask the Father, and he'll give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live in you. You also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my father and you are in me and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love them and show myself to them. Now let's jump over to verse 25 because it's going to mention some of the same concepts about this work of the advocate. I think that's on the next slide. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the advocate of the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, I do not give it to you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled and don't be afraid. Now, this one's not going to be on the screen, but I wanted to read this because it contains another part of the presence of the Holy Spirit not found in this, found in John 16, verse 12. He says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can bear. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will speak not on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me. Now, that, one of the things that helps me understand that last passage is, why isn't there more in the Bible about the Holy Spirit? Why is it left such a mystery? Well, I noticed this. I noticed in the Old Testament that the Old Testament talks a lot about the coming of Jesus. It's almost like God likes to spend a bunch of his time talking about Jesus. The Holy Spirit shows up in the Old Testament. You know, I love it when the prophets like John the Baptist stand up to preach and it says the Spirit of God came on him. This is another thing I'd like to mend. I, I love to see when the Spirit of God really comes up on somebody preaching and they're just going after it and it just keeps flowing and it doesn't stop. And, you know, I, I just think that's really cool. John the Baptist, can you imagine? He's out in the desert, got a mohair sweater on, and he's eating bugs, and he's preaching like crazy, and the, the multitudes are coming. And, you know, when I see G uh, Edward preach, I kind of think of John the Baptist. Do you? <laughs> kind of, a bug-eating, bearded guy, you know. I just kind of make the same connection. I don't, I, I don't know why. But so God talked more about Jesus and the presence of the Spirit than he did about himself. When you get to the Gospels, it's really interesting. Jesus is constantly reflecting back on God. My Father and, and praying to the Father and glorifying the Father and everything's about the Father. So Jesus, talking very little about himself, says a lot about God and talks about the Holy Spirit. But when you get to the Holy Spirit, he speaks very little of himself, and this passage explains why Jesus said he was going to do it, that when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to talk more about God and Jesus than he does about himself. Have you noticed something that's um, pretty interesting about the Godhead? They talk more about the other parts of the Godhead nature than they do themselves. Isn't that an interesting kind of a thing that, that is going on there? Now, I know what I'm about to get into has got a lot of theology in it. And, and, and for the most part, theology gets kind of boring. I, I, I get it. So if you'll stay with me through the theology part, at the end, I'm going to do a real practical life thing so that the theology and the life thing matches, but you've got to wade through the water first to get the outcome. So here we go, looking at the scriptures, parsing out, breaking down what Jesus says here so we get the understanding part so that the practical life part actually makes sense because it's, it's like this passage says, the people in the world don't believe in the Holy Spirit. And actually when we church people talk about this 
Holy Spirit <laughs> living in us. This is what those people are crazy, man. So, so uh, we're going to look at a little bit of the theology about the Holy Spirit and the nature of the Holy Spirit. So let's start from here. When you were created, you were created in the image of God. Which means there is something inside of you at creation that is just exactly like God. That's why you have all the potential in the world from the day you're born to either be a great person in life, but you have another nature living in you that can take you the opposite direction and make you hell on wheels. It's called the sinful nature. So somewhere around about, and it's different for different people, there is no really set age where it kicks in. Somewhere around the age maybe of eight, and a lot of it depends on how you're raised. If you're, uh, I was not raised in a Christian home. Uh, I really am not aware of exactly when my sinful nature kicked in, but I do know by about 14 it was full bore. I was full bore living in the sinful nature, caring only about myself, doing only what, you know, I don't like living under other people's rules, but I like living under my rules, and I want everybody else to live under my rules. I don't know if you identify with that, but I don't want to keep everybody else's rules. I, I, I like keeping my own rules. So that's a part of the sinful nature then that bores you into sin and pleasing self and living to self. And what happens then is at some point you kill so much of the godly nature inside of you that the Bible actually calls it being lost. You get lost. And these sweet little innocent children, uh, you know, I love my grandkids. Man, I just love my grandkids like crazy. But they're starting to be eight. I have one that's eight. I have one, two that are 12, and they're approaching the age. <laughs> oh, when the sinful nature is probably going to kick in, and I, we know it's coming. Carol and I talk about it all the time. We're like, oh, no, these sweet little kids that are such a joy right now. Oh, my gosh, they're going to go the way of the whole world, and the sinful nature is going to bore out in their life, and, man, we need to be there to help rescue them uh, when that happens, and, but we can, we can see it coming. It happened to me. It happened to you. It's going to happen to every human being. I don't care if you're a perfect parent. I know you're a perfect grandparent. But even if you're a perfect parent, you are not going to keep your lovely grandkids from going there. It's just going to happen. And so what the Bible says happens is we get lost. Our, our spiritual nature dies. So something has to happen to resurrect the spiritual nature. So what God did, and the way God does this, is he, he infuses in the heart of every believer when they make the decision to indwell the Holy Spirit in our hearts. So it's almost like a jump start to get you going again. Now, you might say, well, I, I don't, that's just all mystery. How does God do all that? In the nature of God, God is, it's presented in Scripture that God has three distinct natures. We call it the Trinity. It's a triune nature. He has three distinct natures. God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, that's not so far-fetched because you as a human have that same potential. For instance, I am a father, I am a son, and I'm also a husband. So I have three distinct natures that I answer to. You know, uh, my father role is nothing like my husband role, and my husband role is nothing like my son role, and my son role is not like either one of them. So I have three distinct roles in my nature that I have to play out as well. The problem is I can't play them out individually in unlimited places. See, God, because he's capable of anything, God can take a part of his being, Jesus, and put him in a flesh body and live on earth and be with us and show us. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Showing you he's still got his nature of being God. Paul, Paul said uh, Jesus didn't count being equal with God, anything to be held on to in view of our need. So here's Jesus who is 100% God, but he's talking to God in heaven. And you may scratch your head and go, how's that possible? If God's on earth, how's he in heaven? Because God is able to take parts of his being and isolate them into a direction. 
I just think that's fascinating. In theology, that's just fascinating. I can't do that. I can't, you know, be a good husband to my wife and be running off all over the place doing all the things with my kids and grandkids. You know, I have to, I have to parse out my time because all three of my natures always show up at the same time everywhere. But imagine if you could. Imagine if you could go, man, I want to be with my grandkids, but I also want to be with my own kids, but I also want to be with my wife. And you could just go, whoop, and just three of you would walk off in three different directions. Wouldn't that be cool? God can do that. That's the theology that, that the scriptures teach us is that God is capable of doing that. So the Bible says that when God ignites your spiritual being again, part of what he does to help that out is he infuses it with the Holy Spirit. It's not really that mystical. It's not really, uh, it doesn't mean you're going to speak in tongues. It doesn't mean you're going to heal everybody. It just means now you have a divine nature living inside of you. Now watch this. Um, how many of you remember Eddie Haskell from Leave it to Beaver? Oh, yes. He's quite the character. Okay. So did you notice about Eddie that when there were no parents around or authority figures, Eddie Haskell was the, was the rottenest kid in the neighborhood. But the minute June Cleaver walked in with her pearls and perfectly combed hair, always with makeup on, that Eddie Haskell all of a sudden turned into the sweetest, most polite and gracious human being in the whole world. See, he was practicing the presence of authority. We all did it too when the principal walked through the halls at high school, remember? Remember how you were doing something at the locker and you saw the principal and you straightened up your head? We all do it when a cop pulls in behind us. <laughs> I do. I sit up straighter. I, I make sure that I have 10 and, and 3 going on, you know, but that I use my blinker well in advance of the turn. I just drive better when there's a cop behind me because I'm practicing the presence of an authority figure. This is the value of understanding the presence of the Holy Spirit is when you know you have the Holy Spirit, uh, it kind of helps you straighten up your act. You know what I'm saying? So look at the things that happen in these passages. We're going to go through and we're going to break out. Let's go back to the passage before this one. And I've got some words highlighted and underlined because each one of these words suggests something very powerful about what the Holy Spirit does when you're participating and practicing the presence of this authority figure in your life called the Holy Spirit. So he's called an advocate. In fact, in all three passages we read, he is called the advocate. What does that mean? The advocacy of the Holy Spirit basically means that he is your supporter. He is your, he recommends and he protects. So who's he supporting? Us. But he's also supporting God. He's also helping you keep your faith in God because he's supporting your faith in God. He also recommends, and when you read other passages in Scripture, you find out that one of the things that the Holy Spirit does is he appears in the presence of God on your behalf. What is he there for? He's there to promote you in the presence of God. So let's say you've done something. And uh, life's about to stir up on you pretty good. And you're praying, God, please, I mean, I need your help. And, and so the Holy Spirit, in effect, and, and I don't know if this happens literally, but God tells us it happens this way so we can visualize it. The Holy, Spirit's go, Holy Spirit goes into the presence of God and he pleads your case. It might sound something like this. Father, I know you got your servant bill down here. And I don't know if we got a bill in here. I used your name accidentally. Okay. Maybe not. Okay. <laughs> so here's Bill and Bill's done something and the consequences are bearing down on Bill's head and the Holy Spirit goes into the presence of God and said, I know we're dealing with Bill again. And it's the 58th time. Okay. What do we do? And, and maybe, uh, the spirit is, is arguing for grace this time or mercy. Or maybe he's lawyering up for justice. 
or for discipline. You know, Hebrews does say those whom God loves, he disciplines. So God might say, okay, we are in agreement. Go ahead and bust him up. He needs some discipline this time. That's not an act of hate. That's an act of love. Because if God did not discipline us, we would keep doing the same thing. Um, I, I've often said that in the nature of God, the three characteristics of God that I absolutely admire because of how much conflict there is between each nature is love, mercy, and justice. If you're loving and you don't hold somebody accountable with justice, they're going to go do it again and blow their life up. But if you're never merciful, it's never going to feel like love. And that's not just either to let somebody get away with something. So you've got these three characteristics in God that are in constant battle about which one to apply. You actually experienced it raising children. That's why God lets you experience it. Do you spank the kid or do you hug them? Remember that one? Do you jerk a nod in them or cuddle them? Yeah, you've experienced. So God does this all the time, times billions of people. I don't know how God's not worn out, but he does it times billions of people. Okay, so the Holy Spirit acts as the advocate in the courtroom on your behalf. So here's why you want to practice the presence of the Holy Spirit. I want the Holy Spirit to really like me when he goes before God. Don't you? Yeah. If, if somebody's going to stand up on my behalf, I want to be in a good relationship with them. And I, if I have grieved the Holy Spirit, you know, Thessalonians talks about grieving the Spirit of God. If I have created an environment that is so unholy that the Holy Spirit has a hard time being around me, then that's not a good friend going into the courtroom. Although he will be, he'll be faithful to us. But at the same time, uh, one of the reasons the Bible says don't grieve the Holy Spirit is because you really don't want the Holy Spirit to depart. You want to protect the fact that you now have the divine nature living in you and it will help you be a spiritually uh, empowered person. So keep your advocacy with the Spirit in strong check. Now he says, the Spirit will help you. Yes, he does. The Spirit will be with you forever. The Spirit of truth. He talks about the Holy Spirit living in you. See it underlined here, um, there in verse 17. The Holy Spirit will live with you. So he's going to be around you all the time. And he's going to be in you. So when, I, when we talk about practicing the presence of the Holy Spirit, it really means He's right there with you. Did you know the Holy Spirit doesn't live in this church building? The Holy Spirit lives in your heart. That means when you come in here and you sing and, you know, you're all up and you're all excited and, and, and spiritually acting, and then you walk out of here, you're actually supposed to carry the Holy Spirit with you. You actually do. He's right there with you. He was with you last night, every day. That might be kind of something, oh, my goodness, but, but when you practice that, it controls everything you do. I see this sometimes. Um, I go play golf out on the ranch, and sometimes I'm paired with guys that I don't know. And, of course, um, when you're around old men, they're always telling stories and, you know, their life and all that stuff. So we'll be, and, and usually somewhere about the 8th or 10th hole, all the men start talking about what they did for a career. And you'll have some men that were engineers, others that were, you know, uh, um, salesmen, whatever. And they'll get around to me. And I always try to wait till last because I want everybody to, to bear out. Because what I've been listening to for eight holes of golf is cursing and dirty stories, frankly. Disrespectful stories towards women. I don't know why guys are like this. We get to the eighth hole, the conversation, it always happens towards that last part of golf. Everybody starts getting interested in what everybody did for a living. And I always wait to go last. I'm like, Joe, what'd you do for a living for 40 years? I was a pastor. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit shows up. And all these guys 
who were telling their stories. Oh, pastor. Oh, yes. I, too, am a follower of Jesus. I, too, know God. Oh, yes. I, too, am a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And you're like, just a minute ago, you were cussing about, about the missing a putt. You see, when we don't practice the presence of the Spirit, we think it's okay to go, you know, off into sinful nature living. But then when we get around the presence of the Spirit, we know, uh-oh, uh, I better act right. So I know everybody has the capability of practicing the presence of the Spirit. I really believe that. I believe you have the ability to practice the presence of the Spirit. The question is, are you used to doing it or are you used to not doing it? So in that regard, I would say that the Holy Spirit spiritually is like a muscle to us. He's in us, he's with us, he's a muscle, he's a force, he's a being. And you either have exercised your muscle of the spirit and you've become strong spiritually or you have weakened it in dark living. You haven't lost it because it still comes on. You still know how to turn it on when you need to turn it on. But the Holy Spirit's right there with you all the time. There is no turning off of the Holy Spirit in you. So when you know that, uh, hopefully it... it Helps you to do better. Now go to the next passage and you'll see another thing that's going on with the Holy Spirit as our advocate. We'll jump up to uh, the next uh, verse there on the slide, uh, 1425. And you'll see there that the advocate is here to teach us. He says, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you. Now this one's kind of cool. So the Holy Spirit is going to use the Word to teach you. I don't, some people believe that the Word is the Holy Spirit. I, I don't think that's true. I think the Holy Spirit's a being. That's why the Bible says don't grieve Him. He's got emotions. He's got feelings. I don't know if you ever thought about that, but the Holy Spirit has feelings. You can hurt His feelings. And when you do the wrong thing, it hurts His feelings. It hurts God's feelings. That's why the, God in Genesis 6 says He was so grieved He destroyed the earth. Man, I don't want to play into the grief of God. I want God to be, I want God to really be happy with me, especially on the big day when I stand before Him. I want Him to really be happy about me being there. And, and I feel the same way about the Holy Spirit. I want the Holy Spirit to be joyful in me, not grieved in me. So the Holy Spirit's there. He's there in presence. He's there in being. He has emotions. And he's going to be actively involved in teaching me and in reminding me. Okay. Now flip over to 2 Peter. Now that we've got the theology of the Spirit down, Peter begins to make a very personal application about a process through which the Holy Spirit is going to take us in order for us to grow. So go over to 2 Peter chapter 1, and I'm going to look at some things there that will show you a process that the Holy Spirit, who is teaching you, reminding you, guiding you, comforting you, protecting you, being an advocate for you, he's doing all of that, and he's got this process in view that he's going to take you through in life to help you grow spiritually. So in 2 Peter chapter 1, Beginning in verse 3. His divine power has given us everything we need. Now, isn't that interesting? When you say, God, give me the power, he's already given it. God, give me the ability, he's already given it. Oh, God, give me, when you say, God, give me, it almost demonstrates you don't realize you already have it. It's like owning a Mac, but you don't know what to do with it yet. So it's already there. You already have in you the presence of the Holy Spirit. His divine power has given us everything we need for godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his glory and goodness. So one of the reasons I'm camping out on you knowing something is that your knowledge is going to play huge into how you understand the process here. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature. You learned this raising children that when the kids participate, everything goes better. The same is true spiritually. When you participate 
with the Holy Spirit trying to grow you up, everything actually goes better. Having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, here it goes, here's the process. Make every effort to add to your faith goodness. Okay, so faith is when you make that initial trust statement in God. I'm going to become a disciple of Jesus. I'm going to walk the way God has asked me to walk. I'm going to have trust in the leadership of God, and I'm going to have trust in the guidance of the Spirit as He teaches me and reminds me. And I keep, One of the reasons we say to people, keep reading your Bible, is because you, you may not understand that what you're reading you may not need right now, but you may need it a year from now. And that's why you're getting it deep in your heart so that when the time comes to react, you'll already have the plan in view before the need comes. I'm going to illustrate that in a minute when I tell a story about how all this played out in an event that I recently went through. Okay? So you're going to add to your faith goodness. What does that mean? You're going to try to become a good person. Now, I hear people say all the time, I'm a good person. By whose definition? I mean, compared to Hitler? <laughs> really? How about compared to Jesus? Man, I am, I don't know. Do you know anybody that's there? I don't know. Compared to, if Jesus is the standard of goodness, I don't know anybody that's there. I'm not there. I tell you, I, I, I really deeply want to be there. I, I look at Jesus and I go, man, I'm nothing like Jesus. And, 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 and so it's the striving and the goal. I know some people get kind of discouraged with it and they say, it's never enough. We'll never be good enough. You know what? I'm never going to be good enough. I've like, kind of accepted that in life. I'm never going to be good enough, but I'm doggone going to try. I am going to try hard. I think God looks at the trying. I don't think he looks at where you are. I think he looks at how hard you're trying. That's why he says, make Every effort. I used to do that with my kids when I were raising them. Uh, something they couldn't do. The first question I would ask them is, have you tried hard enough? And they go, yes, Dad. I tried real hard. Really, what'd you do? Well, I read the first page. Okay, well, that's not making every effort. You got to read the whole book. Okay, so that, that's really the definition of make every effort. So let's try hard to be good people. So to goodness, we add knowledge. Now, why do they put knowledge past goodness? It's because as you work hard at being a good person, what's going to happen if you don't increase your spiritual awareness, your spiritual knowledge, is you're going to reach a pride phase where you think you're a good person and you're just going to stop right there. What's interesting to me about God and the Bible is the more you learn the more you realize how much you need to know. It's, it's a weird thing. I mean, uh, I, I would say that my ability to perform as a Christian is like maybe right here. My knowledge of where I need to be is like right here. So I'm trying to fill the gap. And what I've learned in life is, I, I remember when I first became a Christian, my first battle was, I got to stop cussing. I really cuss bad. I cuss about everything. I drop F-bombs all over the place. Oh my gosh, I'm a horrible bad person because I cuss. And I remember the first you know, years I was a Christian. I I'm still a Christian cussing. And I'm trying real hard to get out of it because that's not like Jesus. And, and so I was right here. Jesus was right here and cussing was the issue. And then when I finally overcame that, I was like, wow, I'm a good person. <laughs> and then I learned, oh, no, Jesus is way better than that. Oh, man. Now I got to deal with my temper. <laughs> oh. And I, one of the things I've learned as I've gotten older as a disciple of Jesus is I've changed a lot of the external stuff. It's that internal stuff now. Oh, the forgiveness issues and the, and the resentment issues. And, the, and, the, and, and, and they're not out in the open for everybody to see. So the battles are much more internal and harder to struggle with. And just about the time I approach, I think I got a handle on it. My Jesus picture moves up another notch. Oh, my 
I'm not going to get there. You're right, I'm not. And that's the knowledge of it. And that's why it's a good thing, because it'll keep you from being self-righteous, which is cool. Now, you know, I'm never going to get there, but I'm really trying hard. But God's okay with that gap, and I need to be okay with that gap as long as I'm in the trajectory moving up. But I'm never going to catch up with who Jesus is, and that's okay. That's why my knowledge needs to keep climbing so that I don't get uh, religious and think I've arrived uh, somewhere. So to add the goodness then, knowledge, knowledge, self-control. Now watch this. Self-control is one of those huge issues. I mean, really, when you think about it, most of the trouble I've had in my life has been a self-control issue. And now when God gets hold of you and starts changing your life, you don't need mom and daddy to get you under control anymore. You don't need the sheriff to get you under control anymore. You don't need people laws to get you under control anymore. Guess who's got you under control? The Holy Spirit. And he's infusing it enough deeply in you that he's actually changed your desires and now you want to do the right thing. Wow. You mean God can actually make you want and like Doing the right thing? Yeah. You know what the trouble with doing the right thing? is? It's boring sometimes. Am I right? I mean, the whole, some of the whole drama in life is, is what people are drawn to. They're drawn to the drama because everything pops and emotions come. Oh, we love emotions. Can you imagine God changing your heart enough now where you actually love peace and quiet? And the peace and the comfort of the Holy Spirit becomes something you really crave. You're like, I don't want drama anymore. I'm tired of the drama. I don't want you to be around drama. I hate drama. Man, self-control. What a cool feature he brings into our life. Well, when you get the self-control thing going, the perseverance, the ability to stick with it, to make the hard things work, and you stay with it. And then the perseverance leads to godliness. You know what godliness is? It's not... Being like God. It sounds like that's what it is. Godliness is the desire to be like God. It's the emotional part that says, I not only like being a Christian, I prefer it. It's just, the, it's just I love the feeling of godliness, of being, of a, attempting to be like God. It just feels better than the sin did. That actually comes. It's a great reward uh, to experience. And then he says to your godliness, mutual affections. So man, your emotions start coming back and you feel this love for people and then it ends up you being a very loving person. Wow. But it's processed. It means you got to wade through a lot to get there to become a loving person. Now watch how it ends in, in verse 8 because this ties back to Edward's lesson last week. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive. Now, reverse engineer that. If you want to be effective and productive, what do you need to do? Go back to this. I want to be effective and I want to be productive as a Christian. So let me wrap all this up by telling you a personal story about I said I'd get to the personal part of it because we did a lot of theology and got our minds all, you know, tight. But let's look at it from a personal application and see how it plays out. Several months ago, I was down on my dock enjoying the afternoon. And one of the things I love to do uh, since I retired from being a pastor, one of the things I love to do is just sit down on the dock and read my Bible. And you know what I love about it the most is I'm not preparing a lesson. <laughs> you know, I used to preach four or five times a week for the last 40 years. And now I get to just take my Bible down there on the dock and just be with God. Not to educate, to deliver, not to think about everybody else's situation and what I can bring to them. But just me and God at the lake, gosh, it does not get any better than that, I'm telling you right now. So I was down there reading one day, and I had, I had decided, man, I haven't read the Gospel of Luke in a long time, so I'm going to read Gospel of Luke. So I'm plowing through the Gospel of Luke, and I catch myself doing that thing I've done for years where you're now reading, but you're not absorbing. 
And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Go back. I think you lost it somewhere around Luke 2. So go back. So I went back to Luke 2 and started over. And this time, I'm reading real slow. And I'm pondering paragraphs and concepts. And I know it's, you know, it's not new stuff. Because they didn't change the book. And I get to Luke chapter 6. And I'm, I'm really plowing on that chapter because the phrase in Luke 6 was, love your enemies. Oh, man, I stopped on that for a minute. Wait a minute. I don't know that I could really do that. I mean, honestly, I don't think I could love an enemy. I could knock them out. I could shoot them. I could bury them in the desert. But actually love them? Oh, no, you do me wrong. Ooh, buddy. It ain't good. And see, I know my nature. My, my nature, um, I grew up in a very violent uh, background. I had a violent background. I know my nature. I'm real clear about who I am without God. So when you tell me I have to love my enemies, that means I've got to let you walk on me and get away with it. Oh, no. And I remember sitting on the dock going, oh, no. <sighs> okay, God. If I ever had an enemy, so I go play that card. Now, if I ever had an enemy, which I don't think I do, I, I think I could probably love them. Okay? So now I've set myself up for God to put a beat down on me. Okay? So that afternoon, as I was coming up from the dock, I happened to notice about four docks down, uh, about a 14 to 16-year-old boy. And what, the reason I noticed him is he was dressed in really nice fishing gear. And I just really thought it was cool. I mean, he looked like a little tiny midget fisherman. He had the hat and the sunglasses and the fishing, the low rants depth finder t-shirt on and all that stuff. And he was using a fly rod, which I thought, you know, a kid using a fly rod. That's, so I watched him for a little while. And he's fishing away, fishing away. And in a minute, he leaves one dock and goes to another one. He's fishing away, fishing away, fishing away. Okay, now that's unusual at Holly Lake. You just don't see people going from dock to dock because it, it is a private community. So I, for some reason, that I, I, well, he must be one of the neighbor's kids and they all know each other, so it's probably okay. So I walked back up to the house and I had to go that night to pick up my youngest son at DFW. Uh, he was coming in for the weekend. So I picked up my youngest son from the airport, and while we were driving back, he said, Dad, we got to get some fishing time in while I'm here this weekend. I went, okay, we'll go in the morning. Man, it should be good. Bites on, so it, it'll be awesome. So my son and I get up. It's about 5.30 in the morning. We get up, and we go down to the dock, and when I walked out on my dock, all of the tackle bins on my boat were open, and my door was open on my shed. And I immediately, I'm like, Oh, my gosh. So I walk over. All of my tackle is stolen. We're talking hundreds of dollars of tackle. I go over to my boat shed. All of my rod and reels are stolen. And the presence of the Holy Spirit just engulfed me. I wish. Have you ever heard your heart beating in your ears. I've been robbed. I remember saying that to my, to my son. I've been robbed. I hate thieves. I was so angry. And I'm pacing back and forth. And, you know, so I called security. I've been robbed. Need you to get somebody over here. So, you know, they send somebody. Who did? I don't know. Whoever knows who robbed them. You know, I'm, I'm pretty ticked off, you know. I'm not being a very nice person. Golly, I'm such a jerk. And, and so they leave. What can they do? Oh, they wrote it on a piece of paper. That's cool. And they left. So, so while I'm down there, it, it comes to me. You need to set the right example to this young man. You are, you are walking around here like a bull in a china closet, snorting fire. And that is not the way to influence your young man. Where do you think that came from? God was, God was faithful. I'm going to remind you of what's supposed to happen here. I've taught you. Now I'm going to remind you. Okay, 
I, that's not how I felt, but that is what I needed to do. So I have to deny self, imitate Jesus, and lo and behold, you know what came at me? Love your enemies. Oh, don't you want to throw your Bible in the creek sometime? <laughs> I just was, that's the reason two days ago you put that on me, didn't it? You were setting me up for this. Now I got to love my enemies. Oh my gosh. And pray for them. I'm going to kill him. If I find out who did it, I'm going to shoot him and then pray for him. Can you shoot somebody and then pray for him? So I, uh, and then I was walking back up to the house with Eric, my son, and I went, wait a minute. I may have a lead on who did this. He said, really? And I said, yeah. Somebody reminded me, something reminded me of what I'd seen the days before with the young boy out on the docks going dock to dock. What if he came out on my dock and stole my stuff? <gasps> oh, so the Holy Spirit helped me, gave me a reminder. I, I, so I told Eric, I said, hey, let's go. Let's just go door to door and see if we can identify where this boy's from and then just start from there, at least eliminate him as a possibility. So he went with me. Now I have to behave because I got my young man with me. And we went door to door in my neighborhood going down the row of the boat docks until I come to one door. And I'm describing this 14 to 16 year old boy with his hat on and, the, and everybody's going, no, no, doesn't sound like anybody we know. So I get to this one house then I knock on the door, I give them the description and the lady goes, oh my gosh, you just described my grandson to a T. He is a fishing nut. He always wears fishing clothes, the hat, the glasses. She says, you are describing my grandson. And he, she said, the worst part is he left this morning to go back to Fort Worth. He was down with the family the last four days, and he left to go back to Fort Worth this morning. And she said, the other thing that's kind of weird is all morning long, he kept disappearing, going down into the woods and coming back. And she said, I thought at the time, what is this boy doing? Something's not right. And she said, they're on their way driving back to Fort Worth right now. They haven't made it home. Why don't you let me call them and see if they can find out what's happened here? So she called the parents and told them what had happened. And they said, we're going to pull the car over and look in his backpack real quick. And I had described my tackle boxes to a T for her. They pulled over. Opened up the backpack and all my tackle boxes were in his backpack. So I get a call from the dad and the dad says, I'm going to take the mom and the other kids home. And then we're going to turn around and we're coming back to Holly Lake. He has your stuff. And I said, uh, make sure you bring the boy back with you. I mean, if you're going to beat somebody up, you got to have somebody hit, <laughs> Right. I said, make sure you bring the boy back with you. And he goes, uh, I don't know, he may not come. And I said, you need to bring this boy back with you. I said, here's the deal. We can talk about just what he's done that's wrong. Or we can change his life. We need to change his life. I'll help you do that. He said, oh, okay, I'll bring him. He did. He comes up. He, he has my stuff. The boy gets out of the truck. The dad makes him, I, I told dad, I said, let him, he's the one who did this, let him carry it all back in there, put it in my living room in front of the chair there where we're going to talk. I said, dad, let me talk to you just for a minute here. I said, there's something we need to do in this young man's life. He said, what is that? I said, well, first of all, he needs to be disciplined pretty intensely. But we need to finish it with redemption and forgiveness. And I'm willing to participate with you in that if you'll trust me. He said, Joe, do whatever you have to do. I said, you're okay with whatever I'm going to do. He said, yeah, I'm okay with it. Okay. Wanted to get the daddy's permission. So we walk in and we sit down in the chair. I've got the boy sitting right across from me. And I pull out from behind me a roll of duct tape. And I said, make a fist with your hand. He did. I duct taped it so he couldn't move it. I said, make a fist with your other hand. Duct tape it so it couldn't move it. 
He's now got two nubs. And I said, let me tell you why I've done this. If it weren't for God, in other countries I've been in, in the Middle East, if you steal, they chop your hands off. So right now, for all practical purposes, I'm not a Christian, and I just chopped your hands off. You're going to go like this for the rest of your day. And your dad has given me permission to say this. You're going to spend the rest of the day with your hands cut off. Because you need to know that you live in a Christian country. And in a Christian nation. And when people say it doesn't make any difference if you live in a Christian nation or a Muslim nation or some of these other nations that do these violent retribution concepts. I want it to be deep in your heart that being a Christian makes a difference. So the boy's sitting there with his hands taped up. And then I asked the question, why'd you steal my stuff? Well, I don't know. I said, that ain't gonna fly with me. I said, it's not gonna fly with me. And to tell you the truth, you keep saying that, you're gonna get me mad and I'm gonna knock you out. Now, you may, I know some of you are thinking, that's really mean. Listen, we're going somewhere with this boy's life. So he needs to know hellfire is a reality. So I told him, I said, you, every time you say, I don't know, it makes me mad. And if you say it again, I, I'm really going to get ticked off at you. You know why you stole my stuff. So I asked him again, why'd you steal my stuff? Now he's afraid to answer, isn't it? <laughs> and, and in fear, you lose your common sense. I don't know. And so I said, I have to leave the room right now. You got me some mad I want to hit you. So I walked out. I really just wanted to give him time to think about what he's doing in his life. So I walked out of the room. His dad walks out with me. And uh, I said to his dad, I said, man, your son is kind of hard here. He's not, he's not broken. He's not really, I don't really see repentance. His dad goes, what do you mean? And I said, he's not. I said, when you study repentance in 1 Corinthians 7, it's a readiness to see justice done. It's a willingness to come clean with, with what's happened. And it's, he's not just coming clean. And I said, I really need to plow him a little bit. Are you okay with me plowing him? He said, yeah. So we went back in and I plowed the kid. Oh, dude. I said, you have no idea what you've done. Do you realize in the state of Texas, if you steal more than $500, it's a felony? And, I, you know, I had called security, and security is now calling me saying, do you want to press charges on this guy? So I'm looking at him going, do you want me to press charges on you? And he's like, no. And I said, you, you better come clean then, man. I want to know what's going on inside of you. Well, I don't know. I just saw your stuff. Now he's starting to realize, I just saw your stuff, and I wanted it. And I said, okay, so you realize what's happened here is you're willing to make my life miserable to make yourself happy. Oh, he's like, I, I guess so. And I said, not I guess so. That's a reality. You're making yourself happy at my expense. I said, you don't know what you've stolen from me. You stole lures that I've fished with my kids with my whole life, that I have memories. I picture one day putting these lures in a little shadow box when I'm 106 years old and sitting there and I go, oh, I remember that fish. You know, <laughs> that's my life. You know, my memories with my kids. I said, you, you stole my stuff, but you stole my memories. You stole my peace of mind. Because I never locked my stuff up at Holly Lake Ranch before then. Now I lock everything up. <laughs> so you stole my peace of mind. I said, you, you, stole, you, you stole part of my life. And he's, he's starting to cry now, which is a good thing. I know, well, you shouldn't make the little boy cry. No, I love him. I want him disciplined. But I don't want him going to jail. Someday. So I was trying to get on there deep with him. His dad walked out of the room with tears in his eyes. He couldn't take it anymore. I see the dad weeping. And so I get up and I walk out. I, I, I make another one of those. I'm really mad at you. I got to leave the room before I knock you out. Excuses. And I walk out on my porch and the dad's standing there leaning against the post and he's weeping. And he said, Joe, just last week, this boy received Jesus as his Savior. Oh. I said, something didn't take. Something didn't take. I said, you trust me to let me go after it? And he went, yeah, do whatever you got to do. So we both walked back in. And I, said, I told the boy, I said, um, your dad just told me 
that you became a Christian last week. Is that right? He said, yes. I said, let me ask you something. When you were stealing my stuff, did something go off inside of you that said, what you're doing is wrong? He said, yeah. I said, did something tell you that this is a sin? He went, yeah. I went, oh, man. Do you know what you've done? He goes, no. Said, you grieved the Holy Spirit. You shut the Holy Spirit down. And at your age, if you keep doing that, you won't hear the voice anymore. That's wrong. And if that happens, you'll be capable of anything. His dad got him walked out of the room. His dad now is in full flood tears. And he walks out of the room. So I said, I got to leave here. You really need to think about the decision you've made because you've, you've made Jesus your Christ, but you don't know anything about Jesus the Lord yet. And that's in, in a kind of a good way. It gives us a target to hit now in, in, in maturing you as a believer. Walked outside, told his dad, I said, I, said, I, know, you're, I know you're upset, and, and, but look, now you've got a real open insight into how to lead his heart and train him in lordship issues. So he responds to the spirit. In a lot of ways, it's good news. And the dad goes, no, Joe, you don't understand. I know you're talking to my son. But I am an alcoholic about to lose my marriage. Because I have done this. I have shut the Holy Spirit down in my life. I too became a believer years ago, but I just haven't listened to God. He said, I'm so convicted to see this come out in my son that I'm able to look now and see he's copying me. That's why the dad was in tears. So we went back inside and I said, well, let's, let's get to the part of this about justice and all that stuff. So we went back in and I told the boy, I said, um, his dad said, you're going to pay for this. So the boy's got his hands tied. He said, go out in the glove box and get your envelope of your birthday money and you're going to give it to Mr. Joe. So he goes out and he goes, Whoa. he's over at the doorknob, <laughs> which, oh, I mean, you got to not laugh, but it was <laughs> kind of humorous to see. And he turns around and he goes to his dad. He says, I, I can't get the door open. And his dad goes, you better figure it out. And the boy finally got the door open, goes out and gets in the glove box somehow and gets an <laughs> envelope of money and brings it. In. He's got it in his mouth, by the way, coming in the door. And, and so his dad says, you're going to lose all. He had, he had like 800 bucks of birthday money. You're going to give the whole thing to Mr. Joe. So he hands it to me and I just set it on the table. And then we start talking about, I told him, I said, you know what's weird is two days ago I was reading Luke that says love your enemies. You know what I have to do? I have to forgive you. I said, doesn't that suck? <laughs> I have to forgive you. You get to do whatever you want to do, but I have to forgive you. See, that's when people say it doesn't make any difference if you're a Christian or Christianity doesn't really make any difference in your life. Right now you're about to be saved by God again. Because I, I'm going to respond to God and I'm going to forgive you and we're going to let this go. And, and, and so I took the money and handed it back to him and said, I forgive you. Come here, boy, let me give you a hug. So we hugged on up. To finish the story, at Christmas, he shows up at my front door with a Christmas present. And he comes in the house and we sit down and we open it up together, and it's fishing lures. The boy told his mother, he said, I want to buy Mr. Joe some fishing stuff. I hope we change this boy's life. Effective, productive Christianity makes an impact on people. But the better news in the story, his dad has now been sober ever since that event and is involved in chemical recovery. That's cool. I don't, I don't tell that story. I, I really hesitate to tell the story. I, I don't really feel braggy about it. I'm just grateful God showed up and was all up in the middle of that, what could have been a very bad situation, both for my spirit and his. But to realize this is what God's trying to do with all of us. 
God's trying to make our Christianity so practical and so Jesus-focused and Holy Spirit-centered that it has that kind of power, that kind of productivity, and that kind of, effect, uh, that kind of effectiveness. When we live like this, people are going to line up to be Christians. Let's pray together. God, I'm so grateful for the teaching of Scripture that even though it gets kind of theological and heady sometimes, that in the reality, there is so much practical truth in it. Father, I pray that this week, the presence of the Spirit will be strong in reminding your people what we've just been taught here. Strong in guiding and powerful and effective in its outreach. Help us to live like Jesus, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. Hey, guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day. And listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.